Welcome to the Veritas Forum, engaging university students and faculty in discussions about life's hardest questions and the relevance of Jesus Christ to all of life. Well, thank you very much. <clears throat> Let me just say, ladies and gentlemen, what a great honor it is for me to be at this famous and distinguished university. Not only that, I'm so delighted to be interviewed by a historian, a distinguished historian, because that means that we've got the humanities and the sciences together. And not only that, as, as, as Professor Lim has said, he started in a materialistic and atheistic background. I started in the exact opposite situation. And in a sense, having listened to his introduction, I think I ought to be questioning him all this evening. <laughs> what difference does belief in God actually make in this life, since we cannot really know what happens after we die anyway, and more importantly, morality can certainly be constructed without God? Well, for me, the ultimate question is the truth question. My background is Christian. My parents were Christian, and so were my grandparents. From Northern Ireland, of all places, which hasn't exactly the best reputation as an advertisement for Christianity, and we may come to that later. But let me just make clear, my parents were very unusual. They're Christian without being, sect without being sectarian, and they allowed me to think. And so when I arrived at Cambridge in uh, the middle of the last century, um, uh, one of the first things that happened to me was the question, do you believe in God? And then the questioner realized that I came from Ireland. And he said, oh, sorry, I forgot you're from Ireland. I should never have asked you that question <laughs> because you Irish all believe in God and you fight about it. <laughs> now, of course, he was coming from the perspective, the Freudian perspective that my idea of God, obviously Irish genetics, Christian parents, and of course the man believes in God. So I'd like to put your question into the context of truth, because on that day as an undergraduate, I remember it quite well, I decided that it was very important for me to get to know whether or not Christianity was true, rather than just helpful or it made a difference. It was the major truth question. Now, when you formulate the question as you did, how does belief in God help? That strikes me as responding to a need, that I need some sort of help. Well, okay, let me start at that level. I need help. Help to do what? To integrate my experience of reality out there to get some kind of a big picture into which I can fit. I'm a mathematician, as you've heard, and I was always interested, well, where does mathematics fit into science? And where does science fit into the big picture? Now, to focus this discussion from a slightly different direction at the same time is to say that in the academy today, we have essentially two worldviews that are clashing head on. There's the worldview of atheism, naturalism that comes to us from the ancient world. There's also the worldview of theism. And it seems to me that within that context, I would want to say that belief in God, postulating God, if you like, from the perspective of science, it's the one major thing that makes sense of science. Now, do you want me to unpack that a bit? Well, let's... Um, or leave it there. Let's wait for a little bit, because we do want to touch upon religion and science and the sort of impact mm -hmm. that has had in the way that people think about God or re the religious kind of plausibility structure. Um, but let's um, actually jump ahead a little bit to talk about the sort of um, problems that people have with regard to this Christian deity. Um, this is a question that somebody asked. If I were God, I would have made the ministry of Jesus last 30 years, not three. <laughs> and Jesus certainly would have had a one of world lecture tour, not too dissimilar to yours. 
He would have been a terrific Veritas Forum speaker in first century Ethiopia, Judea, Rome, Corinth, and Phrygia, but he didn't. So it, it's difficult to kind of talk about counterfactuals, but why did God make himself so hard to discern? And when the definitive revelation of God came in the Christian discourse, that seems to be the way with the incarnation of Jesus, why was it made available only to a handful of people in that local context and for only three years? How would you explain that? Well, I'd first of all say that the evidence of God is not limited hmm. to the incarnation. In other words, as I look at this, the first major evidence for God, for me, is the fact that we live in a rationally intelligible universe. And I think there's evidence that flows to us from creation and that whole aspect, if you like, the scientific aspect. Now comes the major claim, the central claim of the Christian faith, as you say, mm. is that God became human in Jesus Christ. Now, we can, of course, say, if I were God, I would have X, Y, and Z. And people have been writing theses on that kind of thing for centuries. And I can't second guess God. But interestingly enough, even though Jesus wrote nothing, his ministry only lasted three years. It is amazing as you look back over history what colossal impact those three years had transforming a very tiny group of people, mainly fishermen, not intellectuals, into a force that went around the world and has led to the fact that how many hundred of us are sitting here this evening discussing him. I'm not sure that it's been all that ineffective, actually, because at the heart of that, you see, the argument, as you put it, was I would have had a ministry for 30 years, not three. So the argument really rests on the length of time. Now, I find that fascinating. Well, but because what, if I might just yeah, say a little bit again. more yes, about yeah. it, it's not the length of the time, it's what happened in that time. And that's the crucial thing. And as I see the record of what happened in those three years, John's gospel is a book of signs, starting with the wedding at Cana and Jesus turning water into wine and ending at the climax of his death and resurrection. Those things that happened in those three years are so profoundly important that they have influenced world history. In fact, let me put it even more sharply. There are only three days that separated Jesus' death and resurrection. Yet for me, those are the most important three days in history, not because of their length, but what happened in them. And so it's the content and I can't answer the question, if I were God, I would have done it more differently, et cetera, et cetera. It seems to me there's a third point, though. Really, this question is about the apparent hiddenness of God. Mm -hmm. And I think part of the answer to it is seen in what happened in the life of Jesus. Christianity is an evidence-based faith. That is my conviction that Christianity is true is based on evidence. But what I notice is this, that when Jesus came, we're thinking about him because the question is about him. He did various things. He showed evidence of who he was and his power. But people started to react even then very negatively. Now that raises an interesting question, why negatively? Now, your question was posed in the lifetime of Jesus, oddly enough, by his own brothers. Now, this is quite remarkable to me, that the New Testament records how the brothers of Jesus who'd grown up with him were the last to believe in him. And at one point, they said to him, they were almost frustrated, they said, if you do all this big stuff, if you really are the one you came to be, well, what are you going around here in Galilee?" for in this tiny little obscure villages, go up to Jerusalem and show yourself to the world. So there's the problem. It's stated in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. The New Testament recognizes it, but now here comes the point. Jesus said, look, your time's always ready. Your ideas of publicity are, are clear. Make a big splash, go on television, get on the media, take a world tour. 
But he said, my time is not yet. My problem is this, that I testify of the world that its deeds are evil. Now, part of your message to the world is a message about sin, responsibility, relationship with God, morality, and judgment. You're not going to be popular. And it seems to me that part of the answer to your question, it's a very deep question, I have no simplistic answer to it, is that sooner or later people begin to realize that this is not a merely intellectual quest. God is not a theory, he's a person. And when Christ came into the world, he claimed to be Lord. And therefore he raised all kinds of questions in people's minds because issues of obedience and following and repentance and confession of sin and so on began to come to the fore. And I think you'll find that part of the reason of the apparent obscurity lies not at the intellectual level, but at the moral level. Hmm. I'm not sure if I'm completely convinced, but let's go on to the next question. What would your take on it be? So let's, let's then take this one notch higher and talk about the miraculous events that you've mentioned, the wedding at Cana and the resurrection. Because in the period that I'm studying and writing a book about right now is about how the miracle, how miracles in general were beginning to be seriously interrogated and rendered, you know, simply unbelievable. At the time of the Enlightenment, yes, you right, right. David so, Hume and Right, so and all of those. And I'm studying basically up to Hume. So because Hume is, we all know what Hume does and says, but then there are all of these figures that kind of pre- as show up as precursors of Hume that are raising all kinds of very interesting questions. Not everyone just stops believing in, in miracles, but they, so the rise of critical biblical scholarship on the one hand, rise of early modern science on the other, and combined with this question of, okay, how do we actually, miracles are impossible to be replicated, and history is of such nature that you cannot go back to it and you know, we kind of instantiate history. So if Christianity is a hist- historical religion, and as you said, evidence-based religion, and the miracles are deemed to be either irrelevant or incredible, mm-hmm. then w- the, the question is about religion and science. Because then science came around and says, well, we all know that, you know, although Newton, Kepler, Galileo, Copernicus are Christians, but their worldview no longer obtains in the intellectual kind of elite culture so we cannot really believe in that science anymore. So I mean, how, so this, I guess what I'm trying to get at is, without going back to the early modern period, how, how would you posit the relevance and reality of religion, religious belief, or in particular Christianity, in the face of science? I know you've talked to people like Dawkins, Hitchens, and Singer, so I'm sure it's not a, a shocker question for you, but give us your answer about that. So, because historically speaking, miracles are deemed to be just unbelievable. Yeah. Science has taken over. So how do you continue to posit this theory of the incarnation and say that Christ is Lord and this, that, and other in the face of a whole host of factors that are coming at us, whether scientism or multiculturalism or religious pluralism? And we'll get to them in a minute. Mm -hmm. Well, that's why I'm delighted, ladies and gentlemen, that I have a historian question in me. (laughs) Because what he's just said about the non-repeatability of history. I wish scientists could grasp that the way you grasp it. Mm. Because it seems to me that very often scientists don't realize that there are two kinds of science, essentially. Mm. There's the kind we learn in school and college, do this experiment under these conditions and you get those results. But there are also vast aspects of science where you can't repeat You can't repeat the origin of life. You can't repeat the history of the universe. And so our approach to those sciences has got to learn from historical method. And the older I grow, the more important, it seems to me, the discipline of history is. And I've been very privileged at Oxford to work with Professor John Hedley Brooke, a very distinguished historian of science. Now, there are two things coming to me from that that really fascinate me. Now, you did say uh, very carefully that Uh, so that I didn't have to say it for you, that Galileo and Kepler and Newton and so on were believers in God. Mm -hmm. Now, I I think that's worth just spending a couple of seconds on because it seems to me to be enormously important when we think from today's perspective about the perceived conflict between science and religion. Yes. 
because I usually start with the history. And I say, that's very odd, you know, because the pioneers of modern science were all believers in God. And that is such an interesting circumstance that it's been subject to a great deal of study mm. by people like Alfred North Whitehead, Tom Torrance, and more recently by Peter Harrison, and so mm -hmm. on. And the general consensus is often called Merton's thesis. And C.S. Lewis formulated something like this. Men became scientific because they expected law in nature and they expected law in nature because they believed in the lawgiver. So sometimes I say to people, historically, I'm certainly not ashamed of being a scientist and a Christian because arguably Christianity gave me my subject in that sense. Now you were then careful to go on to say um, that, but we've outgrown that, at least mm -hmm. that's the view of many yes. people. Yeah. And now we come up against this very curious tension because the cradle of modern science was Christianity, and yet within Christianity, there are things like the miracles that seem totally inimical to the foundational concepts of science. And, and therefore, we have to face that, and that was your question. Mm -hmm. how, how do you relate to that? Well, now, David Hume figures largely in this because Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens have both made him very popular in this score because Hume defined a miracle to be a violation of the laws of nature and therefore impossible essentially for any scientist to believe. And I was on the Charlie Rose show. I don't know whether you know the Charlie Rose show, do you? Uh, just a few weeks ago, surprise, surprise, I was invited to face Richard Dawkins <laughs> once more. And he came out of the left corner saying, well, this is Professor Lennox, and he, would you believe it, is a professor at Oxford. And he believes, you know, that Jesus turned water into wine. And really the idea was this is utterly absurd. So I said, Richard, stop right there, stop right there. I said, you know, if Jesus was who he claimed to be, he'd already created water, and perhaps turning it into wine wasn't such a big deal after all. But seriously, I then went on to say, look, Richard, we could analyze every miracle in the New Testament, and you wouldn't listen to anything I said. So it's more because, of a theological issue then, isn't it? Then? Sorry? Not a scientific issue. It's a theological question. Oh, whether no, you believe but for him it was a scientific question because right. I said, you won't listen to it because you have an in-principle objection. Right. And your in-principle objection is David Hume, and he said, that's right. So that's what we need to deal with. Are miracles violations of the laws of nature? Now, let me give Lewis's illustration. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, I quote Lewis, and I'm not ashamed to do it. I'm old enough to have listened to him lecture, and he influenced me in those early days at Cambridge profoundly. But this is his illustration. I'm staying in a hotel here tonight. So I put $100 in the drawer, and I put $100 tomorrow night. One plus one is $200. I wake up in the morning and I find $50. Now, what do I conclude? Do I conclude that the laws of arithmetic have been broken or the laws of the state of Tennessee? <laughs> now, you laugh. Why do you laugh? You laugh because you see that it's not the laws of arithmetic have been broken, it's the laws of the state of Tennessee. But what tells me that the laws of the state of Tennessee have been broken? The fact that I know the laws of arithmetic. See, I want to be very radical here. I think Hume was completely wrong. In that, miracles do not violate the laws of nature at all. What are the laws of nature? They are our descriptions of what normally happens when nothing intervenes. The laws of Newton's laws of motion will tell you how a billiard ball will go on the table provided no one just lifts it off the table. The laws of science, the laws of nature, are not causes. Newton's laws of motion never caused the billiard ball to move in the history of the universe. People were accused of that. So what we've got to realize, first of all, is what these laws are and what they're not. They're descriptions of what normally happens. Now, I believe in a God who created a universe that's stable. It's got inbuilt regularities, and we've recognized them. We call them the laws of nature. But God is not a prisoner of those laws. He can feed a new event into the system 
And of course, the system takes over. So let me go to the biggest miracle of all. God encodes himself in humanity. A virgin becomes pregnant. Joseph, her husband, knew exactly where babies come from. He knew the laws of nature. <laughs> and so when he heard this story that she was pregnant, he wanted to divorce her. He just didn't believe her because he knew those laws. It took an intervention of God speaking to him so that he recognized, no, Joseph, this is okay, because God had done something special. Similarly with the resurrection, if I were claiming, ladies and gentlemen, that the resurrection occurred through natural processes occurring in the grave, then it would be a violation of the laws of nature. But I'm not. What I claim is that Jesus was raised from the dead by an intervention externally, the power of God. Science cannot say that's impossible. It would be absurd to think so. So I think that Hume has misled people. And incidentally, just before he died, I had a lengthy interview with Anthony Flew. Mm. Anthony Flew, the most distinguished Hume scholar of his generation and one of the world's most famous atheists. And I talked to Anthony Flew because late in life he became a deist. And I said to him, what about human miracles? And he said to me in his own sitting room, he said, Hume was wrong, and he said, all my books would need to be rewritten. And he said, I wish I had the time to rewrite them, but of course I cannot. So it seems to me to be extremely interesting that this idea that miracles are violations of the laws of nature has spread the myth that therefore it is impossible to be intellectually respectable and believe in miracles. I just don't think that's the case. Hmm. Well, let's assume that that's, that is the case, that miracles do and can occur. Then it, the, it raises the stakes even higher. Yes, if God can intervene in, in these quotidian affairs by doing miraculous things, why doesn't God? For example, you and I both know that one of the leading defeater issues for people giving up on Christianity has been the deep contradiction between what one says in one's confession and what one does um, you know, in the same way, especially how, um, you know, how one behaves toward the other, the religious others or racial others. Mm -hmm. assuming, that, assuming that God does exist and God can do miracles, why are the worshipers of God so violent and mean? So violent. Yes. Christians, for example. Yep. So, and couldn't God stop them from being, there is a famous American TV show called Men Behaving Badly. Couldn't God stop these followers of God, you know, stop them from behaving badly? I mean, I know you grew up in Northern Ireland and we are here in the South where the legacies of the Civil War and the segregation are still with us. Yes. Both emancipation and enslavement, both blue and red states, both opponents for civil rights and proponents of the same quote the scripture to justify their view. They can make, that can make someone very jaundiced and cynical about Christianity. As you and I both know that there are a lot of former Christians who have walked away from the faith precisely because of the contradictory confession and one's, one's actual life. So uh, if, why doesn't God do more? I know I'm being slightly facetious, but, but there's no, a No, you're not. But there's you're you're, you're, you're hitting on a very serious question, I, yeah. it seems to me. No, I don't take that as facetious at all because many of my friends from my own country, they've yes. walked away from God because yep. of what they experienced. Right. And I take this immensely seriously, ladies and gentlemen, because, well, can I react in a personal way? Because it's affected my own family. My yep. brother was nearly blown up in an IRA bomb, and my parents tried in a sectarian country to employ equally Catholic and Protestant in their store, and they suffered for it. So they were very unusual people in those days. So I grew up with this thing, and many people say to me, even today, I got questioned this week, how do you possibly still believe in God, granted the history of your country? That's really your yep, question. That's right, that's right, yes. So let me uh, give the short answer. I know that Historians look at Northern Ireland, social historians, and say, yes, religion isn't everything. There are the social conditions and all that. But let's leave that aside. Right. There's enough of a religious element in it to have this effect. Mm -hmm. 
and it puts people off. So how do I respond to it? Well, to be utterly honest with you, I am ashamed of it. Utterly ashamed of it. I'm ashamed that the name of Christ has ever been associated with a bomb or an AK-47. But I want to tell you why. And the reason is this. That people that take bombs and guns and weapons to defend Christ or his message aren't following him. They're disobeying him. Because Christ publicly repudiated the use of violence in his defense. Now, this is vastly important. I used to wonder why there's so much in the New Testament, historically, about the trial of Jesus as distinct from his crucifixion and resurrection. I think I understand why. Because as I talk to Christopher Hitchens, who felt this very keenly in the Edinburgh Festival, he just came across with a barrage of this stuff. And when he finished, I said, Christopher, you're dead right. This is the unacceptable face of religion. And then I went into this answer. And Jesus was put on trial. Why? He was accused of being a terrorist in contemporary language. He was accused of fomenting political revolution. And the case was so sensitive that the Roman procurator, Pontius Pilate, took the case himself because it was such a sensitive issue, and I'm glad he did, because that trial is so ironic, because the very thing that Hitchens accuses Christianity of is the thing that Christ was accused of, fomenting violence. Now, how does Christ plead? Are you a king, says Pilate? What sort of a king? What sort of a ruler are you? Are you threatening Rome? And the answer came like this, my kingdom is not of this world. Otherwise, my servants would have been fighting that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from here. And Pilate realized instantly that Jesus was no threat to him. And you remember the conversation that went on? To this end I was born, said Jesus. To this end I came into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. And Pilate said, perhaps not cynically, what is truth? And he went out and declared Jesus innocent. Now, this is immensely important, but there's something more. Pilate had in his desk the report of the centurion that led the arrest party that went to arrest Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And you remember what happened there, that Peter had a sword, and he took it out, and he wasn't a good swordsman. He tried to cut a chap's head off, but he missed it, and he cut his ear off. <laughs> Do you remember that story? Yeah. Now, you may think, gosh... Richard Dawkins would have a field day with this. Well, he may be listening, so let him have a field day. What did Jesus do with that ear? He put it back on again so the man could hear. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let me just apply that a little bit. What I observe historically and what the new atheists confirm to me is this, that the moment you take weapons to defend Christ and his message, you cut the ears off people in more ways than one, and they won't listen. That's the point you're making. And I believe that I have a task, and those of us who are Christians have a task, to put the ears back on, to redress the balance by explaining exactly what Christ's attitude in this is. So I repeat, people who take weapons are not Christian because they're a Christian is someone that follows Christ. And Christ said it must not be done. That's the first thing. But now there's a, 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 another side to it, and you might even want to comment on this. One of the things that concerns me about the new atheist attack in this direction on Christianity is its lack of balance. There is no excuse for the Inquisition, the Crusades, and all the people, the blood that's flowed in Ireland and everywhere else, no excuse. And John Lennon sang a song, you remember, that Dawkins loves to quote, imagine a world without religion, yep. without the Taliban, without Northern Ireland. How anybody could imagine a world without Northern Ireland? I didn't say that, Ireland? but I, I got the point. I know, you, you know that. Well, I'm not John Lennon, I'm John Lennox, and I've written a song too. <laughs> and it's called Imagine. Imagine a world without Stalin, without Pol Pot, without Mao. You see, the thing that the new atheists are often silent about 
is the bloody legacy of atheistic regimes. I've spent a lot of time in Russia. And I'll never forget a senior Russian academic saying to me, John, we thought we could get rid of God and retain a value for human beings, and we found we couldn't. And we murdered 50 million of them. Now, I am alarmed from the historical perspective at this total bias. Nothing good comes out of Christianity, nothing bad said about atheism. It seems to me that there's a balance that needs to be redressed there, and both sides need to be put. Having said that, I still stand where I stood at the beginning of this little piece, that I'm ashamed of it because it has put countless people off. Now, I don't know whether behind your question, Paul, lies the bigger one. And that is the whole question of evil and suffering. And right, we'll God get to that. Yeah, you sure. know, that, that's in one sense a separate one, but it's related. That's exactly right. I mean, I think it's, um, I mean, from your answer, I think I, I see no problems with the conversations about Jesus. Because, I mean, most people are okay with Jesus. Gandhi was perfectly okay with Jesus. <laughs> but he wasn't okay with the, the English followers of Jesus who no, came no, to his no. country and did what they did, right? And so I think that is precisely the sort of problems Christopher Hitchens at all have. And many, many in this town as well. You know, I think some of my most ardent secular atheist friends grew up fundamentalists. And Going perhaps to your answer to it is the right one that you hinted at when you asked the question. I forgot about it. That if our confession mm -hmm. doesn't match the way we live, we are not credible. That's right. And the real answer to this question is that Christians live in such a way that they're attractive mm. and they're seen to care for their fellow men. We believe that every man and woman is made in the image of God. Well, let's practice it. Let's value other people and so on. Uh, and I think you've hit on, and you know, we can do that one by one. Right. I mean, so I think so often I think we Christians are so quick to justify and defend and say, oh, if only you knew the real story about the crusade, you wouldn't be saying that about the Christians. I think then it really does a terrible injustice. It does, it? yes. Historically, it does. Yeah. So, um, well, let me, uh, let me ask that related question you've already alluded to earlier about theodicy and suffering, which mm -hmm. I suppose you talked about at Rice last night, <laughs> yes. um, Rice University. So. So this is a, a survey question that, that came to me. Um, why does God allow innocent children to be born deformed or mentally handicapped? And you will know something about this. In Russia and Eastern Europe, handicapped children are systematically institutionalized in adult, adult mental facilities where they are neglected, abused, and forgotten. How can I believe that God has a plan for their lives? And this is another kicker. Why should I believe that God will treat me any different? This is from a student or whoever it was that maybe she or he's in, that, in this audience today. This is the hardest problem I face. This is the hard problem. And I have no simplistic answers to it. But I've got something to say about it because I meet this all over the world. I've stood in Auschwitz many times, just to add to the misery of things. I arrived in New Zealand two days after the earthquake and had to meet people who'd lost a husband and a wife. And we meet these things, either remotely or nearby. How do we cope with it? And to be honest, many of my close friends are atheists because of this problem. They said, I, I just, you know, I've had a short circuit in my head. I, I can't get my, don't talk to me about a personal God. I mean, you're almost insulting my intelligence by talking about a personal God in this context. And I'm very sensitive to that. Now, this question, ladies and gentlemen, has two sides to it. First of all, there's a problem of pain. That is the natural disasters and so on and so forth. Then there's the problem of moral evil, what human beings do to one another. The, the case you mentioned was the problem of pain, and plus moral evil, and moral the way evil, people right. treat it. They often run yes. together. Right. But then there are two aspects. Let me put it this way. Cancer looks very different to an oncologist than to the woman of 23 with four children who's just told, been told she's six months to live. 
There's that intellectual side to this problem, but there's a very deep pastoral side. And one of the troubles that seems to me is that when we go into it, we mix these things all up and people are hurting. I know in a big audience like this, some of you are hurting. This is a massive problem to you. And you may have just felt, well, God, what's the point in talking about God? I'm hurting. Well, let me try and say something, Paul. I regard this not as definitive, but just as a way in what I find helpful because I've been forced to think about this. Number one, atheism seems to be a solution in the sense that we respond and we say, well, look, there is no God. This is just brute fact. This is how it is. And in fact, Richard Dawkins takes that to its logical limit, which I'm going to mention because it's important. He says this universe is just what you'd expect it to be. If at the bottom, there's neither good nor evil. There's no justice. DNA just is and we dance to its music. Now that's extreme. That's the logical consequence of naturalism. I notice, of course, that if there's neither good nor evil, you can't talk about a problem of evil. And that's one of the big problems with atheism. They still talk about evil, even though some of their premises deny its existence. But let's not leave that aside, because that, in a way, is something that, that doesn't appeal to many people for reasons that I could explain. Let's come right to the heart of this. Atheism says, well, there is no God, and for most people, life is pretty miserable. It ends, and that's it. I notice what atheism does not do. It doesn't remove the suffering. It does remove all hope. And I pointed out to Richard Dawkins in one of our discussions, I said, Richard, your view is very bleak. And he said, it is bleak, but that doesn't make it false. I said, no, but it doesn't make it true either. So it's very important to see that atheism, although it instantly seems to give an answer, it doesn't solve the problem. The suffering's there, and indeed, it could be said to compound the problem because it removes all hope. I have the problem because I still believe in God. Now, how do I face it? Well, the way I face it is this, that the universe that God has made, when it comes to moral evil, it's easier to understand than the problem of pain. Let me say something about it very briefly. I think Lewis was right. God could have made a world in which humans didn't destroy each other, oh, but would they have been human? He could have made you a robot. Now, would you have liked to be a robot? If I had a robotic wife to greet me when I go back to Oxford, she might be of an iPad here system marked kiss, and I'd press the button kiss, and I'd get a robotic kiss. It would be meaningless. Because love is only possible. Saying yes is only possible in a world that you can say no. And it seems to me that part of the problem of moral evil is that God took the risk of creating people with free will. And if you ask, why did he do it? I would have to ask you, why do you have children? My first little child daughter, I remember holding her and thinking, I brought this child into the world. She could grow up to say no to me. Why do I take the risk? Well, I think you know the answer to that. That love and the possibility of love are valuable and meaningful things. And that helps me a little bit in a way in. Now, the world appears to be a damaged world. If you look at Coventry Cathedral, you see on the one hand beautiful evidence of design, and you see on the other hand that a bomb has hit it. And in a way, humanity looks a bit like that. We see some traces of wonderful beauty and elegance in our universe and in people. And then we see damage, we see deformity, we see disease, we see illness. Now, suppose there is a God. How can we face that? Two things and I'm done, very briefly. If death is the end, as atheism says, then there is no justice. 
So if you feel that it isn't fair for a child to be born with a deformity or a disablement, and incidentally, surveys in the United States are fascinating. They show that the level of happiness of disabled students is exactly the same as that of able-bodied students. It's a fascinating recent survey. I leave that aside. If you say that isn't fair, then you're raising a very deep question. Is there a God who compensates? If there is no God, there will never be fairness. Indeed, there will never be justice for the vast billions, the vast majority of people who've ever lived. The terrorists will get away with it. Hitler, megalomaniac that he was, when he gets cornered, he blows his brains out and there's no God, there's no accountability, so he's won. Is that the way the universe is? Now, because I believe that Christ rose from the dead, I believe that death is not the end, and there is to be a judgment. And that is a wonderful thing, because it means my moral sense is not an illusion. That sense that cries out for fairness and justice, I believe, will one day be satisfied. Now, let me come specifically to this question. How do I face a deformed child? How do I face my sister when she telephones? and says her daughter of 22 has just had an explosion in her brain, just married, and a tumor gone. How do I face that? Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is the difficult thing. Try and follow me. I have no easy answer to it. But if I'm asked what's the bottom line, it's this. I say, this is hard, it's very hard to grasp, but is there anywhere in the universe evidence that would convince me that God has such a quality of love that he can be trusted with the ragged edges of our human experience? That's my question. You see, we can argue for centuries, and people have done if I were God, I would have done this. Surely a good God would, could, might. And we go on and on and on, and we're never satisfied with the answer. So why not ask a different question? And the different question is this. Is there anywhere in the universe evidence that God can be trusted beyond the apparent limits of human endurance with this? And I think there is, and it's the cross. See, ladies and gentlemen, Let's take this seriously for a moment. You know that Jesus died. But the crucial thing about this is that if he is God, the question it raises is, what is God doing on a cross? This is a God that suffers. If that's true. It's telling me at the very least that God has become part of, of the problem of suffering, for he himself has suffered. And because the cross and the death of Jesus were not the end that he rose again, I see a doorway there. And I've watched how people who have been suffering, who have been told that life is coming to an end, and I'll never forget sitting in a group of children with spina bifida, very deformed, some of them. And one of them could hardly make himself heard, and he said to me, you know, he said, people look at me, and they say, why? And he said, I say, why not? The child, who's only 10 or 11, said that and explained to me that he trusted God with his deformity. That's big stuff, ladies and gentlemen. Atheism has nothing to put alongside that. And I say, I have no simplistic answers, but it seems to me here there's a way in, and it's a way in that many people have taken to be able to face the most extremes of suffering, the like of which I have no experience to put 
alongside it. So that's how I'd start to approach that problem. Well, uh, a related question. Well, let me ask you a, sort of a lighthearted question. And we'll get back onto the serious and more substantive <coughs> things. Someone asked, so do you ever doubt as to whether you might be wrong? So do you ever doubt that you might be wrong about all the beliefs that you hold? Do I ever doubt that I might be wrong? Of course, yeah. all the time. I mean, <laughs> what is doubt? Mm. The trouble is when we use the word doubt, most of us have a vision of a sort of black hole engulfing our own whole psyche and the whole universe begins to shake. But doubt is the opposite side of faith and trust. How does trust grow? By asking questions. And let me take you back to that first incident in Cambridge, you know, that was so marked for me. Of course you believe in God, you're Irish, you see, that, that kind of attitude. And I thought, well, I've heard that before. But now, could he be right? Is it that my faith is simply a Freudian projection and so on? So I decided that day I was going to do something about it. So what did I do? I decided I was going to get to know people that did not share my worldview. And I discovered an agnostic among the mathematicians. And then, driven by this, I went to Eastern Germany and spent 20 years traveling very frequently behind the Iron Curtain, talking to people that have been systematically exposed to atheism. And I've done the same in Russia since 1989. For what reason? Because, ladies and gentlemen, I want to be certain. And I spent my life playing Socrates, constantly questioning the validity of my own beliefs. And if you call that doubt, then absolutely. But constantly calling in question and never being afraid to say I don't know, or being afraid of truth and learning from everybody. So it seems to me to be very important. A lot of people are f afraid of that doubt thing. So they keep their faith on a very superficial level. If Christianity is true, there's no reason to be afraid. Now, does that answer your question, or do you think yeah. I've done no, it? No, well, very, very similar, I think, because for me, I... I Would live... you feel the same? I mean, you grew up in a, yeah, I mean, in a very me, different background. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about how you... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when I did the Veritas for my Claremont Colleges, that was one of the questions, actually. So, um, yeah. So I think for well, me, tell us what you said about it. Yeah. Um, in three minutes or less, two minutes or less, um, I, when I became a Christian, that was in the least expected or planned. And when I became one, my world came falling apart. Really? In that I lived to be popular. I lived to be in the in crowd. And I became a Christian as a third-year university student. Um, my father was a political prisoner in Korea, so at age nine, my father was incarcerated. I didn't see my dad for about three and a half years. Shortly after his release, we moved to America at age 15. And then at age 21, I became a Christian. So in six-year intervals, I had these catastrophic kind of you catastrophes that have happened to me. Um, and just raised a lot of questions. But when I became a Christian, I thought, man, you know, this is the end of the world as I know it. <laughs> On the one hand, I found that, okay, life makes sense with Christ, I think. Uh, but I still had a lot of questions. Mm. Um, I think it was a social suicide for me to become a Christian. Because back in those days at Yale in the late 80s, being a Christian was not a cool thing. And I wanted to be part of the cool crowd. I know it sounds so vain and silly, uh, but maybe not so. It's I mean, real, though. This is real. So, um, so I think I, but then I had a lot of intellectual questions and hang-ups about the Christian faith. So I did philosophy as my second religion, and I still have, that's about 40, I uh, know, it's about 23 years ago that happened, and I still have a lot of questions mm -hmm. about the Christian faith, and I often say that the reason why I am a professor in the divinity school and also doing intellectual history of the early Enlightenment period is, these are the questions that I have about the Christian faith. Yeah. And I live the questions, I raise the questions, but there are insufficient defeaters for me to walk away from this whole yeah, thing entirely. Right. But then I have had a number of recent questions because and when you're in the academy, especially in the humanities, the way that the game is structured and set up raises different sets of questions. You as a mathematician and a scientist believe in truth with a capital T. 
Many in the humanities have basically given up on that. We believe that social construction of knowledge and morality and religion is the way things are. So how would you talk to an Oxford undergrad or postgraduate, someone who is in comparative literature or theology, <coughs> uh, someone who's doing Sanskrit, you know, and that sort of thing? Uh, if someone were to say, well, isn't all religion, isn't morality basically socially constructed anyway? Uh, science has told us religion is irrelevant, but it's my religion is no better than, no worse than your religion. What audacity do you have to tell me that I should repent and change my ways? Because couldn't we just all sort of agree to disagree? And the minor details don't really matter anyway. Mm -hmm. And I know you've been asked questions of that sort Oh, of I'm surrounded by it, yes. Um, <laughs> it's very interesting, the people that tell me that reality is socially constructed expect, expect me to believe that that statement is true. <laughs> it is quite amazing. I, I must, can I tell a little story? Well, yeah, Just yeah, to but, illustrate yeah, this. Yeah, okay, all right. Because sure. uh, what we're but nobody talking, really believes that in reality. No, nobody does. But There's it's a theory that gets... This postmodern relativism, even the French, I believe, is, have given postmodernism up. They have ultramodernism now. <laughs> but uh, one thing that really focused it in my mind was when I was sitting in my college at lunch beside someone who had a book. I'd never met them. They were a guest. And the book on the table uh, looked intriguing to me. And I said, is that your book? He said, yes. I said, what's its thesis? He said, the thesis of this book is that there's no such thing as authorial intention. <laughs> so I said to him, I said, I tried to keep my face straight, and I said to him, I, I said, do you mean to tell me if I read this book, I'll understand there is no such thing as authorial intention? He said, absolutely. Well, I said, I'm not going to read it. He said, why not? Well, I said, if your thesis is true, there's no point in reading it. It had never occurred to him. He lost his temper, stood up, and walked off. A friend of mine, ladies and gentlemen, says that people are usually only postmodern in areas that they think are not important. There's nobody postmodern when it comes to how much money they've got in the bank. And saying, my truth is that I've got $100,000 black. And you think, I, I owe the bank $250,000? Well, that's only your truth. I think actually it's important to realize that I find, and I talk a lot to literature people, I'm actually very interested in the humanities because I've worked all my life with a classicist and he taught me how to think. So don't run away with the idea that I'm anti the humanities. I love literature and the way in which it's written and so on and so forth. And I'm very interested actually in the sociological uh, comment on science because one of the things positively that the sociologists of science have pointed out that science is not so objective and dispassionate as people used to think it was, that we bring our prejudices and so on. But the postmodern extreme, I notice certainly at Oxford, maybe I'm generalizing, has run its course a little bit like logical positivism because it contains at its heart a contradiction. So if we back away from that, we can then say, well, to what degree is what you're saying a relative statement and so on and so forth? Because what is true is you say, nobody lives in a totally relativist world. Everybody believes in truth. You all believed in the truth that there was a session here at seven o'clock tonight, whether you're a postmodernist in literature or not, and you came. We've all got a concept of truth. So it seems to me that we need to, we need to temper that a little bit. But you're right. It's easier to talk sometimes to the scientists. Because as Richard Dawkins, we, we had an interview, a press conference after one of our debates, and one of the journalists from the Times said, is there anything on which you two agree? And I said, I think there is. I think Richard and I below, both believe, we're critical realists in that sense, we believe there's truth out there and it can be approximated and grasped. And he almost said amen, but of course it's theology forbidden. <laughs> <laughs> well, John, I've got many more questions that I've uh, printed off here uh, from the survey and also from my own, but I think it'll be better for the audience and for, for you as well. We were to stop our part here and then open the floor up for questions. And the way that we're going to engage the questions will be this way. Um, so rather than taking one question at a time, 
what uh, Professor Lennox will do is, uh, if you have a question, come on up. I think there are two mics over there somewhere, and I hope we get some light in this uh, place because it's been really, really difficult to interact with the audience. Um, do you so know, I noticed there, there are some people here. I know, I just thought <laughs> there were about 20 people here, and there are people in the back. So what we'll do is, uh, if you have a question, please come on up to those two mics over there. And let's say we'll take about, John, about 10 questions, shall we? Well, and then you can aggregate them and then answer them in, in, yeah. in that order. Does that make yeah. sense? So My experience, ladies and gentlemen, is this. That in an audience like this, everybody's interested in other people's questions. So what I'm going to do is give you a chance to hear the other people's questions. Mm -hmm. So just state your question briefly, keep it on the topic, and I'll alternate and I'll write down a few, and when we feel we've got enough, I will make a few comments. So off you go, number one. How would you respond to people, particularly mathematicians and philosophers, who doubt the validity of basic principles of logic, like the principle of non-contradiction, and who say that we cannot really have absolute knowledge, only knowledge based on logical principles that we cannot know to be true. Okay, thank you. Number two. <laughs> yes, um, in personal discussions with, with a lot of people um, here at this university, as a matter of fact, the questions come up, how do you reconcile that there have been people in the world throughout history that are, as at, at all personal standards, have been morally exceptional, have been incredible people as far as moral standards are concerned, that they've lived exceptional lives, but yet they don't claim a faith, let alone the Christian faith. Um, and I'd just like to know how you reconcile those two things and how that the Christian faith um, can say that those people, though they've lived morally exceptional lives, are ultimately you know, doomed is, is a very gloomy word, but um, to, you know, an eternal life in, in some underworld or some, a life of, an eternal life of punishment. Okay. So. They got the question three. So when you sp spoke earlier a bit kind of on theodicy, um, I considered that you said that perhaps the Crusades or the Inquisitions or events of this kind in which humans do these kinds of cruelties in God's name, and you say that they are not following God. However, equally, you have your own path, and they have their own path. And we look at traditions of hundreds of years, and it's, it's difficult to say that. How can you make that assertion that their path is not the path, whereas you say yours is? Okay. And beyond that, um, when the things that they did, which caused a great deal of pain. You say that there can be justice for this, some kind of recompense. How can you recompense these events? Because they are so deep, they cannot be negated. The death of a person cannot be undone. How can these be accounted for? Okay, four. So, uh, these might not be, this might not be as deep as some of these other questions, but, uh, We'll so, judge that. So, <laughs> um, so you know, we talk a lot, everyone talks a lot about natural disasters, like floods and earthquakes killing you know, thousands or millions of people and that being evil. But my question is, is a natural disaster like an earthquake in itself evil or does it become evil when people are killed by it in the sense that like, it's the splitting open of the earth any more destructive than eating an apple and destroying it? Yep. And if the answer to that is an earthquake or in itself isn't evil, can there be suffering that's caused not by evil or sin? Okay, thank you. Five? Yeah, well, my question is kind of connected to the previous question because um, as Christians, we believe that God is all-powerful and all-pervading. So I was really interested in what you said before about um, uh, when there's a lack of morality and people question the existence of God. So my question to you is simply, uh, would you agree with the statement that sin does not exist, that, um, that the bad, so-called bad things that happen are just contrasting expressions of the good and bad by the universe, because I believe that God is the universe. So as human beings, we perceive things as good or bad, but in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't really matter, because in the, in the eye of God, they're the same. 
Okay, six. Uh, you fashion yourself as a Christian scientist. Uh, my question is in reference to that. Uh, one of the main themes of the Old Testament is the discouragement of rational inquiry. This is evidenced by the Tower of Babel, the banishment of the, uh, from the Garden of Eden, from eating of the Tree of Knowledge, and the disparaging of Cain's descendants from building cities, uh, for building of cities uh, and engaging in art and culture. Uh, blind faith is rewarded and questioning is punished. Isn't your position that critical thinking is compatible with the Bible, an egregious twist of the book's actual message in order to conform to, to today's general consensus that science serves humanity's best interest? Okay. I think I've understood that. Now, how many more will we take? It's so one number is six, right? So let's do four more. So well, we'll uh, take it. Uh, let's take more. two more and see what they are. Okay. Four. All right. okay. <laughs> I just don't want to keep the people till midnight. Okay. Um, a lot of this discussion, we've talked about moral objections um, or moral obstacles to becoming a Christian, and uh, through people uh, and people's actions. But a question that I wrestle with is, how do we reconcile the character of the God of the Old Testament? with the life and teachings of Jesus Christ uh, in the New Testament. Okay. Right, we'll have one more just at the moment. Okay, that's putting me on the spot. But um, <laughs> So is. I'd like to start off with Einstein's God. Um, Einstein was spiritual in a certain sense, but not as most theists are in today's society, in that Einstein believed in a God and the harmony of everything that he saw around him. So I'd like to first start off by, by asking you if there is a difference between a believer in, say, Christianity and what Einstein thought was true. And secondly, I'd like to um, rebut what you initially said. I'm sorry about this. But you had said, you had spoken about how God, the, the very fact that Jesus' birth had such a resounding impact on human life. But I can, I, can, I can bring about something as arbitrary as the jeans that I'm really wearing right now. They're really uncomfortable, but... They're the fad in today's society, right? Everybody's wearing them. <laughs> and, and further on, um, I'd like to point wait out... A minute, the... Wait a minute, you're having three questions. One each person, I think. That's enough. <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll stop there. It's, it's not fair to the others, okay? So is that... Okay, well... Yeah, just hang on, and if we've time, don't stand up, sit down again, and uh, you can line up if we've got time at the end, because there's enough for several hours here. This is a Q&A, and like our previous Q&A, we can only give little snippets of answers. And so by definition, they're going to be inadequate. So what I try to share in things like this, you've heard the spectrum of questions you've seen, and that's been interesting to me, where the bias of the questions lies. A lot of them are in the problem of theodicy, suffering, and so on and so forth. That's interesting, because it shows that this is a very important question to people in the audience. So I'll make brief comments. They will be inadequate, but I hope they lead you to think further. This is the purpose of a Veritas Forum, that they lead you to think a little further. Now, I'm going to start with the last one, Einstein's God. Einstein is an interesting character, and Richard Dawkins makes a great point of this in the God delusion that he says Christians are always quoting Einstein as if he believed in God. Einstein was not a theist. He didn't believe in the personal God in that sense. But he said he doesn't deserve to be called an atheist because he had a great sense of a spirit of reverence for the universe and in particular for its rational intelligibility. And often the God of Einstein or the God of the physicist, as he's called, is that kind of thing. Uh, an attitude that says, well, there's something out there. There may be some transcendence, some spirit, and so on. Not the God of the Bible. And the question is, what's the difference? Well, of course, there's a vast difference. Because I claim, not simply that the universe is rationally intelligible, that it gives evidence of intelligibility. I'm much more concrete than that, as you realize. I believe that the God revealed to us in the Bible is the true God of space and time. But I think that Richard Dawkins is very unwise to 
give the impression that Einstein was a kind of atheist. Einstein was the person that drew our attention more than anybody else to the thing that is so amazing that most of us don't notice it. He says, the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it's comprehensible. And that, it seems to me, is a doorway into the kind of thinking that has appeared recently in a very interesting book by atheist philosopher Thomas Nagel in New York. And his book is called Mind and Cosmos. It's a very provocative subtitle. Why the Neo-Darwinian account is almost certainly false. And he fastens on this idea that intelligibility lies at the heart of science. And he says intelligibility, consciousness, language, is not reducible to physics and chemistry. And that almost certainly means that the dominant philosophy in the academy today, naturalism, is false. So there's a lot of big stuff hanging uh, uh, in there. So let's now go to uh, another question. The claim is that the Old Testament discourages rational inquiry. That's the first time I've ever heard anybody say that. That's very interesting. I was intrigued on what you based it, the story of Babel. Let me remind you that the Old Testament contains on several places the commandments of God. And the number one commandment is what? Love the Lord your God with all your mind. In fact... The foundation of taxonomy is biblical. Every academic discipline central to it is the naming of things. If we went through the academic disciplines represented in this room, and if I talked to Paul about the technical terms in his field, he'd soon lose me. I could give you a lot of mathematical terms, and I'd soon lose you. Language, the taming of the world out there by language is one of the fundamental intellectual disciplines. Where did it start? It started at the beginning of Genesis. The fascinating thing about the story of Genesis is that God told human beings to name the animals. That's the beginning of biological taxonomy. God said, do it yourself. Get interested in the universe. And so, to hear that the, the Bible is against rational inquiry when in fact it commands it seems to me to be very curious. Now, Babylon is very interesting. I'm about to bring out a book, actually, uh, discussing this because the city of Babylon, and you were saying God is against the arts and the humanities and cities. He isn't. According to Scripture, there are two major cities in the Bible. One is Babel. And the other is Jerusalem, and they occur as a light motif right through the Bible, and you meet both of them at the end. Mystery Babylon, the great a city, and the new Jerusalem. God is very interested in cities. Indeed, Abraham, the pioneer of the Hebrews, fascinatingly, he left the Babylonian city of Ur of the Chaldees. Why? Well, God said, I have prepared for you a city. God isn't against cities. But what God is against is what Babylon represented. And what did it represent? This is fascinating to me. Coming from the ancient world, Babylon represented the attempt to forge a universal unity without God. Let us make a city and a tower. Let us make a name for ourselves, and let us build a city and a tower that it might reach to heaven. This is a profound analysis of where humanity goes wrong. Now, I don't want to dwell on this, but it enters into philosophy and literature at every corner. There are basically two philosophies of life. One is that human beings create themselves. Have you noticed the cities in the world competing for the largest building? It started in Babel. It is a symbol, of course. It is a symbol of pride. God wasn't against the cities. But that idea that we create our own meaning and significance is the idea that needs to be analyzed. And the very interesting thing is that standing against that, Abraham was called out and God said to him, I will make your name great. 
And ladies and gentlemen, if I might turn it into a slight parable, it seems to me that we're either living for the one city or the other. We're either restlessly trying to create our own image, our own city, our own values, or we've learned to trust God for our significance. Now, it seems to me in that apposition, it's not anti-intellectualism. It's a question of how we use the intellect. And I would refute completely any idea that the Bible is anti-intellectual. If I wanted the Old Testament, if I wanted really to deal with this subject, I would give you a lecture on the brilliant analysis in the book of Daniel, for instance, of the values that motivate leaders and the reasons why civilizations rise and fall in terms of their culture, in terms of their concepts of image and ideas and so on. The trouble is that we don't take the Bible seriously enough, even as a book. And one of the things that convinces me that the Bible is authenticated by God is precisely the depth of its intellectual analysis of some of the biggest problems in existence. Think of the analysis of theodicy in the book of Job. It's as profound as you'll get in any literature. And so I could go on and on. So I'm sorry uh, uh, to disagree with you, but I think the very opposite is the case. And therefore, uh, far from simply accommodating myself to the spirit of the age, it's the exact opposite. It is the Bible that for me that has opened up the world of intellectual inquiry. I notice, incidentally, that it's naturalism in the academy that's closing down intellectual inquiry. So that in some academies, you don't discuss God. You don't discuss the big ideas in history. Naturalism is the default view. But that's anti-intellectual. So it seems to me the shoe is entirely on the other foot. And we need to open up our minds. And that's why I'm delighted that your university hosts this tonight. That it believes in a spirit of free intellectual inquiry. That's closing down in many parts of the world. And it's not being closed down by people who believe in God. It's being closed down by people often who don't believe in God and do not want these questions discussed in a public forum. So that should be enough about that for a moment. Um, there's one question about the Christian God all-powerful from the person that believes that God is the universe and that sin doesn't really exist. Well, if you think sin doesn't really exist and watch the shooters in some of the schools in the United States recently, I don't know what kind of world you live in. Sin really exists. And Richard Dawkins in one of his books says, how trivial, we're all worried about sin, 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 sin. But sin is the major problem of every government in the world. And it's my major problem. To pretend that sin doesn't exist, I think, doesn't make the problem go away. The wonderful thing, that's one of the reasons I'm a Christian, is that Christianity recognizes sin for what it is, but offers a solution, repentance and forgiveness, rather than pretending it doesn't exist. Woe betide us if we pretend it doesn't exist. Sorry to be direct, but I think it's important um, uh, to, 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 to do that. Now... Earthquakes, are they evil in themselves? No. And when I lectured on this, and incidentally, if you want to know more about this, if you Google my name in New Zealand, there's a whole web page devoted to television interviews and, and, uh, and lectures I gave in New Zealand. But your question is absolutely justified. And here's the fascinating thing about it. Our world floats on tectonic plates, and they shift, they rub up against each other, and we get earthquakes. Now, here's the irony of the problem. If that didn't happen, life would be impossible. If you read any book, serious book on plate tectonics, and oddly enough, quite by accident, I was reading a book on this topic just before I went to New Zealand, and it was pointing out that our atmosphere and many other things depend crucially on those shiftings of the plates of the earth for life to exist. And yet they cause disasters. The disaster is caused, of course, not by the earthquake, but by people building 
on top of where an earthquake is. Now, that doesn't solve the problem of natural disaster, but it raises deeper questions, and you get them by the hundred. Can God create fire that doesn't burn but heats? Can he create electricity that isn't dangerous? This world is a very dangerous place, isn't it? But it seems to me it's important to realize that the earthquake in itself is just the earth doing what the earth does, and our lives depend on it. So complex is the whole system that that is actually the case. So my answer to your question directly is no, it's not evil in itself. Right. Now, um, the Crusades came up again, and uh, you said that I, I said the people were not following God. Uh, how can you make that assertion? It's not me that makes the assertion. It's Christ made it. It's Christ made it. A Christian is a person that follows Christ. And so in order to know what attitude I should take to violence, I see what Christ did. It's on a historical record. We don't have to guess it. So it's not a question, and I hope you didn't misunderstand me because it was the last thing that I would uh, want to suggest that I'm arrogantly making that assertion against other people that make the opposite assertion. It's that here are the historical documents that reveal to us exactly what stance Jesus took. And I'm just making a simple statement that being Christian is following what Jesus said. Now, the second part of your question had to do with justice and recompense, and these things are so deep, how can they be put right? Now, I accept that as a very weighty question. But, you know, we look at it through our human perspective. The shock comes when we realize what Jesus claimed. There was a famous incident when he healed a man who was paralyzed, and he said to the man, your sins are forgiven. Now, suppose I had offended Paul very seriously, and I was sitting here, and you came up and said to me, your sins are forgiven. I think he might say, excuse me, excuse me, I haven't forgiven him. Who do you think you are? Mm -hmm. That's exactly how people reacted. No one can forgive sins, but God alone. In other words, Jesus is not behaving as an, simply a human being. He was a human being, but never merely human. He was God incarnate. And therefore, he is capable of doing something that none of us can do. He can forgive sins. He can give us eternal life. Now, you rightly recognize this is a very deep problem. But the answer, and it's another of the reasons I'm a Christian, the answer is big enough to meet the problem. And the answer is that when a person trusts Christ and receives his forgiveness, they get a new life, the very life of God. Now, you may say that's mythology and fantasy. No, it isn't. But it all depends on who Jesus is. And again, I would say to you what I said earlier. I see enough evidence of God's character to trust him with those ragged edges. And sometimes I think, you know, that if you could see what God has done with some of the people who suffered unjustly and so on, if you could see now in the world to come what God has done with them, you would have no more questions. But at the same time, I mean, okay, I'm sorry to interject. But, yes, but please do interject. But there are a lot of people who basically reject the sort of eschatological argument, saying that the recompense will be there, therefore the suffering that we endure is bearable. I mean, there's authenticity and integrity to the terrible nature of the suffering that we, especially senseless suffering, right? And, and so I think the, the question that this person was asking has more to do with the sort of follower of putative followers of Christ doing horrendous things and the incongruity between the confession and the behavior is precisely the reason why people walk away. And the other question that came up was about scripture. So, I mean, there's a, I mean, you, that was raised about the Old Testament deity mm -hmm. and the New Testament deity, right? Mm -hmm. And then um, you can, there are injunctions about extermination of tribes. Mm -hmm. Well, let's we, come to that. Let's, okay, let's look sure. At that. Okay. Let's look at that because yes. 
The, the question, as you realize, is the fact that at certain points, let's take a specific one, the invasion of Canaan yes. under Joshua. And when you read the text, you read these commandments to exterminate a whole group and so on and so forth. And you say, but look here, what? this is hideous. Well, let's think about it. It's another of those very hard questions. The first observation I would make about that is this. The record does not appear in an obscure book of the Bible. On the contrary, it appears in the book of Deuteronomy, which is precisely the book whose morality is used to condemn that action by moderns. That's the fascinating thing. Here's the very book of the Bible that says you don't murder, you treat people carefully, and so on. And in fact, as our chief rabbi in Britain, Jonathan Sachs, recently pointed out in a fascinating book, here in the book of Deuteronomy, you have the first humane rules of war. You have the limitations, the suing for peace. Don't burn the trees down, and so on. Try to preserve everything in the very book that describes what seems to be, to our minds, an atrocity. Now, that strikes me as very important because it shows me that whatever happened, the Bible is not ashamed of it in the light of the morality that's used to condemn it. So there must be more to it. Point number two. The Israelites were warned that if they got involved in pagan practices, they would suffer the same way. And there's a back history to this, because Abram was told, centuries before that his descendants would go to Egypt for 400 years and only then would they travel to the so-called promised land because, and here's the reason given, the iniquity, the sin, the evil of the Amorites is not yet full. So let's just look at the facts. Let's not try to evaluate it for a moment. As I see it, what happens here is this, that the coming of Joshua into the land is coterminous with the judgment of God on one of the most evil nations that ever existed because they had institutionalized one of the most hideous practices of the ancient pagan world, and that's child sacrifice. Now, we would instinctively say that needs to be judged. That's hideous. Our problems come, of course, when A, human beings are involved in participating in the judgment, and secondly, it would appear that innocent people suffer. Now, if you put those two things side by side, the lofty morality of Deuteronomy, the value of life, and this apparent slaughter, you then have to do a little bit more work. And some of it has been done here in the United States by Nicholas Waltersdorf. Sure. There's just been a big conference of this topic. And he points out that there are certain technical phrases that we need to be aware of. Now, I'm going to tell you this for what it's worth, because there's still a problem. Let me tell you what it is for what it's worth. If I said to you, all of the world came to the funeral of Princess Diana, weren't there some people in bed with flu? Well, of course there were. It's a hyperbole saying a great mass of people came. Now, Nicholas Woltersdorf and other scholars point out that this kind of phrase, like wipe them all out, occurs again and again and again and again. So much so that he thinks that it's got a technical meaning. It certainly doesn't mean wipe them all out because they all weren't wiped out. Because the very books that record those actions tell you that those cities were still full of people a very short time afterwards. In other words, the actual history shows that what happened was not a complete extermination at all. So that Waltersdorf concludes that what this meant was secure a decisive victory within the norms and the rules that are laid down in this book, which is why the thing is recorded without embarrassment. Now, it seems to me these things are worth thinking about, but, and here's my bottom line, 
Even if all that's true, ladies and gentlemen, since we have started this lecture tonight, uh, this discussion, wonderful atmosphere, thousands of innocents have died. That is the fact. So when we've done all the explaining, thousands of innocent children, women, men, have died in the most extreme circumstances in our world. Some believe in God, some suffer for their faith, the majority don't. And so we're back to our old problem. And there are only two possible reactions to it. Either we say this is so overwhelming, it blows my mind, and we give up on God, or... We look at the fact that we've got a concept of justice and morality and right and wrong. We've got hopes. We've got a sense of morality. And we say, is this all an illusion? And I go right back in a circle and I make no uh, apology for it because it seems to me that all roads converge again to the cross of Christ. And that's why I repeat what I said earlier. One day we'll see not only justice done, but justice seen to be done. If there is no God, what is utterly sure, none of us will ever get any kind of justice. Atheism is no solution. So although that's a very hard question, it seems to be a very real possibility that there are ways of thinking about the Old Testament that don't just look at this as a crass kind of genocide. Now, finally, um, uh, two questions, very briefly. First, the math student who doubts the basic principle of logic. Well, I wonder why on earth he's doing maths, because you can't do maths and doubt the basic principles of logic. In fact, the law of contradiction, you cannot doubt it because it's one of those things that is properly basic. Now, if you don't know what that means, there's a wonderful little book that's just been written by a British philosopher. He's a young philosopher, very gifted, called Peter Williams, that goes through all these things like the law of non-contradiction and the basic laws of logic and how we use them and relates them to questions of faith and science and philosophy. I just mentioned that en passant. So, um, as I say, the math student isn't here, but I respond to someone who says that you cannot do mathematics or anything else. You cannot even discuss anything. Rationality ceases because these are basic things behind which you can't get. In order to question them, you have to assume them. That's the point I'm making. Now, the final question here is how do you cope with the fact that there are exceptional moral people who do not share your Christian faith? It's a very important question because very often Christians sadly give the impression that atheists are in, incapable of moral excellence. That, of course, is nonsense, ladies and gentlemen. And it's nonsense from a Christian perspective. Because from the Christian perspective, every man and woman is made in the image of God as a moral being. And that's why my atheist friends can sometimes put me to shame. And I'm so glad you asked that question, that we must respect and admire moral excellence wherever we see it. Now, that's important, actually, in the dialogue, in this public dialogue. If I look at you and you don't believe in God or you're from a different religion, if I get it into my head, that from my perspective, you are of infinite value as a moral being in the eyes of God. I'm going to respect you and treat you carefully. That is an axiom in my life. I debate the new atheists and people say, why don't you go for their throats? Well, because I respect them as human beings. I want to befriend them. 
Because I believe, ladies and gentlemen, we can have rational public dialogue. So let it be made absolutely clear. I admire people from any religion or none, and some of them have been, I can think of them as I talk to you, outstanding men and women. And at the moral level, I'm not worthy to wipe their feet. But now, there comes a parallel question. When it comes to morality, interestingly enough, virtually every religion, every philosophy, says essentially the same thing. There's a core of morality that's common. C.S. Lewis noticed this and wrote about it in a famous book, The Abolition of Man in 1940, a brilliant book. And people recognize this. Of course, you'd expect it if you believed in God because every man and woman is a moral being. At the level of morality, people respect the truth. They respect their elders. Of course, there are variations on the theme, how many people you could marry and so on. But by and large, the core of morality is the same. Otherwise, society would fall apart. The difference comes when we consider the question of relationship to God. And we've been talking about many questions tonight. And any religion or philosophy must face this question. And with this, I'm going to finish. If there is a God, if he's got standards, and we've been thinking about them, we all use our morality to judge other people. But when I use that morality that I judge other people with to judge me, I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. I haven't even kept my own standards. Now, let's face this question. I rejoice, as I said tonight. I'm delighted that God is one day going to put things right. But what about me? How am I going to face that? Now, any religion worthy of the name has got to face that question. And here is where the great divide comes. Not at the level of morality, but at the level of what is the basis for a relationship with God. For by and large, I discover from my friends that many people regard religion, and even Christianity, a bit like Vanderbilt. That is their examination system. You get into Vanderbilt, you get in, you have to do exams to get in, don't you? You have to get grades, yeah, good yes, grades, yes. yes. So there's an entrance, initiation into Vanderbilt. And then you study like anything, and at the end, there is the final judgment. <laughs> there are final exams. And on the way, you have wonderful professors, like Professor Lim here, to help you and guide you and advise you. But you know, even he can't guarantee you're going to get a degree. Can you, Professor? Quite a couple of times didn't work. So. You see? <laughs> because the basic principle at every university in the world is merit. You get through if you deserve it or not. Now, because so much in life is like that, it's like that in business. You get promotion if you deserve it. But people think it's like that with God. So that... The popular opinion is that if I try and live a reasonably decent life, then God, who is the judge, he knows that I'm weak and have my difficulties and so on. He's not going to be too tough on the examination in the end, and he surely will drop the standard a little bit and let me in, and I'll deserve to get in. Think about it, ladies and gentlemen. Would you base your relationship with a human being on that? Let me tell you a story. My first day at Cambridge, I saw a girl. It happened sometimes. And she was a glorious vision. She really was. I married her eventually. And we've been, mar we've been married for 44 years. But suppose now, I came to her and said, Sally, you know, I'd like you to be my wife. Now, here is a present for you. It's a cookbook. <laughs> And it's full of laws. If you want to bake an apple cake, thou shalt take two pounds of sugar, thou shalt take two kilos of butter, thou shalt take, thou shalt mix them together in a bowl, and thou shalt put it in an oven, and thou shalt turn it up to 100 degrees centigrade, and so on. Now, I say. 
Of course, I'm not prepared to accept you now. But if you follow the rules of this book for 40 years, let's say, and if you earn enough to keep me in the manner to which I'm accustomed and give me a decent holiday every year or two, then I'll think about accepting you. How, how would you respond to that kind of a proposition? It's absurd. There are millions of people, ladies and gentlemen, that treat God that way. I'll try and keep your rules, God and hope one day you'll accept me. You wouldn't insult a fellow human being by thinking like that. See, the wonderful thing about my marriage is she, for some reason, accepted me right at the beginning. I know why I accepted her, but she accepted me. And the fact that my love for her doesn't depend on her cooking sets her free to cook. Have you got it? In other words, ladies and gentlemen, I live to please her, not to gain her acceptance, but because I've already got it. Why do I do these talks and discussions? Do you think I'm doing this to try and gain God's acceptance? Nonsense. I'm doing it because God has accepted me years ago. And this is the great divide. In Christianity, the acceptance comes at the beginning, not at the end. It's not based on merit, which is why we can be certain. If my acceptance with God depended on my merit, I'd be arrogant to say I was certain of it. But because it depends, and here we are again, because it depends on what Christ has done on the cross, I can know myself accepted now and be utterly sure of one day enjoying an eternity with God. Ladies and gentlemen, let me put it to you this way. Jesus competes with nobody else for the simple reason that nobody else in any philosophy or anywhere else in the whole of world history offers me anything like what he offers me. You've been very kind to listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. But I want you to thank very specially tonight our moderator who's done a magnificent job. Thank you very much and good night. <laughs>